Welcome. In today's episode, we're going to discuss the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur. Pretty much everyone already knows that the Wright brothers were aviation pioneers, but let's look a little bit closer. The Wright brothers grew up in Dayton, Ohio, although older brother Wilbur was born in Indiana. Their father was a traveling minister and a bishop in their church. Their mother did something few other women did at the time. She attended Hartville College in Indiana, where she studied literature as well as science and math, and she was very mechanically minded. She nurtured the brothers' curiosity in how things work and in figuring out how to make them work better. As the brothers grew up, bicycle riding was a national craze. Everyone wanted a bicycle. So what do two enterprising young men who like to tinker with mechanical things do? They open a bicycle shop right there in Dayton. In addition to people zipping around on bicycles, this was an era of rapid advances in technology and science, including aviation. People had already been flying around in hot air balloons, but people increasingly were trying to invent what today we would call an airplane. A lot of famous people were involved, each with their own theories about how to make a heavy piece of equipment become airborne, stay there, and travel wherever you want it to go, rather than just floating along in a balloon. We aren't going to get into the science of aeronautics today, but to oversimplify things, think of air almost like an ocean you can't see. Air exists. It's a thing. It has weight. And it moves around in great currents and waves, just like the ocean does. So in some sense, people learning to fly were trying to figure out how to build a heavier-than-air machine that could simultaneously overcome the pull of gravity and become airborne, while also harnessing the powerful physical forces created by the unseen ocean of air. Some of the most brilliant scientific minds of the era also were trying to invent the airplane. Neither of the brothers had gone to college, and Orville had dropped out of high school. But these two bicycle mechanics were confident that they were as qualified as anyone else to design a workable airplane. To succeed, though, the Wright brothers knew they had to solve three problems. They had to find a way for their heavier-than-air machine to defeat gravity and get off the ground. They had to be able to control the airplane as it battled the competing forces of air currents and gravity. They needed power not only to get them up into the air, but to keep them there and to move the plane whenever and wherever they wanted it to go. The Wrights saw the second piece, control as their biggest challenge, so they started there. After a lot of thought and study about what others had done, the Wrights looked at the problem the way any respectable owner of a bicycle shop would. How do you control a bicycle? By using the handlebars, sure, but also by shifting your weight. Skillfully and instinctively, shifting your weight around on a bicycle is a key part of remaining in control, especially as you go around curves. They also watched birds and saw that when birds fly, they make small adjustments to their wings to control their motion. So they landed on these two concepts as the keys to learning how to control what we will go ahead and call an airplane. Long story, but they solved it by accident, as is so often the case with great inventions. Wilbur was absentmindedly twisting a long rectangular box that bicycle tubes came in. He suddenly realized that the way the box bent as he twisted the ends in opposite directions caused the flat surfaces of the box to shift very similarly to the way birds adjust their wings as they fly. It was one of those light bulb moments. Putting all of this together, the Wrights called their solution wing warping. To cause the plane to turn, you had to be able to twist the two ends of a wing in opposite directions, causing one end of the wing to lift and the other end to lower. To do this, they designed what they called a hip cradle. 
the pilot would lie flat on the hip cradle on the lower wing of the airplane, fitting snugly within its U-shape. By shifting his weight from side to side within the cradle, the same as if he were riding a bicycle, the pilot could pull on wires connecting the cradle with the wingtips, twisting the two ends of each wing in opposite directions, just like Wilbur had twisted that cardboard box of bicycle tubes, causing the plane to lean into a turn just like a bicycle. They started experimenting using large kites and then large gliders to learn more about wing warping. They did their research and built their models in the back of their bicycle shop in Dayton, but eventually they needed to find a place better suited to flying full-size kites and gliders. They needed somewhere with a lot of wind, some place with wide open spaces, no trees, that had a soft surface to land on, and some place private where no one would bother them. So they went to Kitty Hawk, a small fishing village on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Just south of Kitty Hawk was a group of large sand dunes called the Kill Devil Hills. The area was perfect, and the Wrights got to work, flying, and often crashing, large kites and gliders from the top of those huge sand dunes, beginning in 1900. Well, things didn't go well at first. They kept spinning out of control and crashing whenever Orville or Wilbur tried to fly on it as a glider rather than flying it like a kite. That soft sand sure did come in handy. Through many experiments in Ohio and North Carolina beginning in 1900, the brothers overcame the problems of lift and control. They added two horizontal panels to the front of the airplane, an elevator, for the pilot to control the airplane's pitch, the angle at which the nose of the plane was pointing up or down. Being able to control the plane's pitch was critical for controlling when and how steeply the plane climbs and descends. You still see the same thing on airplanes today. They just aren't on the front of the airplane anymore. They also added a movable tail to the rear of the plane to keep it steady when they were banking into a turn. Otherwise, the plane tended to slip sideways or spin out of control when trying to turn. You still see the same sort of movable tails on modern airplanes as well. They also had to come up with an entirely new shape for their wings to provide enough lift to get their plane into the air and keep it there. Again, using a lot of trial and error with a wind tunnel they built in the back of their bicycle shop in Ohio. With lift and control now solved, all the rights needed was power. Charlie Taylor, a bicycle mechanic who worked in their shop in Dayton, developed a lightweight gasoline engine made of aluminum, something that had never been done before, making Charlie Taylor an aviation pioneer in his own right. The brothers used their wind tunnel to design the first effective airplane propeller to provide the thrust that planes need to get airborne and maneuver. Using everything they had learned, the Wright brothers now designed what became famous as the 1903 Wright Flyer. It was 40 feet long and 605 pounds, with an elevator in the front and a tail in the back. Their new aluminum engine drove two rear-mounted pusher propellers using chains with the propellers spinning in opposite directions to counteract the twisting tendency in flight. The plane had skids rather than wheels since they were landing on sand and used a long wooden rail as sort of a runway for takeoffs. They shipped the parts and pieces of their new plane from Dayton back down to Kitty Hawk, assembled it, and tried again. On December 14, 1903, at Kill Devil Hills, Wilbur, lifted off in their brand new airplane, and immediately crashed. He had tried to lift into the air too steeply, stalled, and came straight back down. Three days later, having repaired the plane, it's Orville's turn, and he does it. The plane lifts off the wooden rail they're using as a runway, and Orville flew it under his control for 12 seconds, 120 feet about the length of a modern 737. They flew three more times that day, 
with a fourth flight lasting 59 seconds, going 852 feet. The Wright brothers had flown the first free, controlled, and sustained flight in a power-driven, heavier-than-air machine. With the basic science and engineering now solved, they turned to converting their invention into a practical airplane they could offer for sale. Unlike some of their competitors, they had paid for the entire project out of their own pocket without any help from any government, foundation, or university, so they needed to make some cash. They moved their test flights from North Carolina back home to Ohio. They were able to test in relative privacy in a pasture close to Dayton because even the local newspapers did not pay them all that much attention. Few people had ever seen the brothers actually fly, and there were very few pictures of them doing so. The Wrights were always concerned about someone stealing their ideas, so they remained secretive and reluctant to fly when reporters or cameras were around. As a result, a lot of people thought the Wright brothers had just made up the story about flying in a place most people had never heard of, so they didn't pay them much attention. It wasn't long, though, before their work in Ohio resulted in the world's first commercially practical airplane, with longer and longer flights becoming routine. Once they felt their plane was perfect, it was time to pull back the curtain, demonstrate their invention to the entire world, and start selling the things. The brothers began making demonstration flights to potential customers in the U.S. and Europe. Not surprisingly, observers were awed, and the brothers became international celebrities. Together with investors from Ohio and New York, they formed the Wright Company in 1909 to build and sell their new airplanes. By now, though, other people, especially in the U.S. and France, had joined the Wright brothers in designing, building, and trying to sell workable airplanes. Their competitors were eager to continually introduce new designs and technology, while the Wrights were reluctant to change a plane they thought was already pretty much perfect. In the United States, Glenn Curtis, one of their chief rivals, designed a plane using a simpler and more practical way to turn without twisting the airplane's wings. He attached hinged flaps to the ends of each wing, ailerons, French for little wings, that the pilot can adjust up and down to achieve the same aerodynamic effect as the Wright Brothers' wing warping system. Modern airplanes use Curtis's aileron control system, and no one tries to twist the wings of an airplane in flight. Curtis attached wheels for landings rather than skids, and sat upright in his first airplane, the June Bug, rather than lying flat on the lower wing. Glenn Curtis won prestigious contests and prizes as early as 1908, even against the Wright brothers themselves completed his own set of aviation firsts and became particularly noted as a pioneer in the field of naval aviation. Glenn Martin was another contemporary of the Wright brothers who quickly built on their success and that of Glenn Curtis, even merging his first business with the Wright Company in 1916. Glenn Martin's second company, eventually became what is today the Lockheed Martin Corporation, one of the world's premier aerospace companies. The Wright brothers faced stiff competition from Europe as well. Commercial companies in France and Germany began manufacturing copies of the Wright Flyer even before the Wrights formed their own company. By 1909, the French had refined the Wright brothers' design to include monoplane wings, a closed body, front propeller, rear elevator, single control stick, wheels, and the aileron flight control system that Glenn Curtis had used. The designer of this plane, Louis Blériot, became the first person to fly an airplane across the English Channel in 1909. The more familiar-looking planes used in World War I nearly all built in France, Germany, and Britain, not much more than a decade after the Wright brothers flew their odd contraption, 
shows just how quickly other aviation pioneers took over from the Wrights in driving their invention forward. After Wilbur's premature death in 1912, Orville kept up the brothers' many lawsuits against inventors they believed had copied their idea, especially Glenn Curtis. But he sold his interest in the Wright Company in 1915. Orville had never enjoyed business as much as Wilbur had, and with Wilbur gone, sort of lost interest. So the brothers' company passed into the hands of others, first Glenn Martin, and in a twist of fate, it eventually merged with Glenn Curtis's company to become the Curtis Wright Corporation. That company is still around today, headquartered in North Carolina, where that very first flight occurred. Not surprisingly, Orville remained one of the most influential voices in the aviation industry for the rest of his life, eventually passing away in 1948 at the age of 76, 35 years after his brother. So what happened to that first airplane? Well, for many years, Orville loaned it to a museum in London rather than allowing the Smithsonian to display it. The Smithsonian had incorrectly given credit for inventing the first workable airplane to its own leader, Samuel Langley, not to the Wright brothers, greatly upsetting Orville. In 1942, the Smithsonian finally agreed that the Wright brothers had in fact invented the airplane, and Orville relented. The original Wright Flyer from 1903 is now on display at the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum in Washington. So now you know the story of the Wright brothers. Think of them the next time you're in an airport waiting to catch a flight. See you next time.